So um, there's the topics. We'll go through Metasploit payloads, which we've already talked a bit about, and then uh, web dev, and then PHP my admin. These are just common uh, utilities that have common flaws. And then how to use directory traversal to steal fun things off a server, what kind of fun things you might want to steal. Then uh, these other things, the most interesting part here, I think, is the NFS shares. So um, Metasploit payloads, we've already done this quite a bit. So when you're running Metasploit in, typically in Linux in the command line, although it does run in other operating systems, that's where you usually get all the power. So if you show payloads with just having opened MSF console, you'll see every payload it has, which is like 200 lines of stuff. But if you use an exploit and then show payloads, it will only show you the payloads that you can use with that exploit, which is better. And so if I use eternal blue and then show payloads, I get a relatively short list of 20 or 30. And of course, it's kind of funny that you have so many because usually the only thing you want is a Metasterpreter reverse shell. That gives you everything you could possibly want. But there are all these others in case you don't. And of course, there are situations where one or the other is not working. And the worst thing, of course, is if they have an antivirus at the other end, then you might really go through all these. And we haven't talked about it yet, but there are um, virus evasion options in Metasploit. They're not worth much as written, though, because they're public, so all the antivirus companies quickly modify their stuff to detect all the ones in Metasploit. And so uh, there are other frameworks out there, like Veil Evasion. And one thing I'd like to add to this class, which I might get to this semester, is just a project where you write your own. For $30, there are guys in Russian forums that will write a custom encoder. It is supposed to be very easy. I haven't done it. But all you have to do is do anything to modify the code, like flip every third bit of every fourth byte or something and then write some kind of thing in front of it that undoes that. And now you've got a thing that will not be recognized by the antivirus engine. And if you just write your own, it doesn't have to be super mathematically perfect or anything. It just has to be something that confuses the antivirus detection. And that's not too hard to do. So there's two kinds of payloads. Uh, the more common kind you see in Metasploit is staged payloads. If you do our exploit development class, you'll see this. Uh, when you find a weakness in software, like you, I was just doing on that CTF, you put in funny input until you get a funny output. So you find something that the software misunderstands, and you find some way to exploit that. So you find a way to inject code and run it. But typically, you can only inject so many bytes of code, because you're putting in something into like a price or a password field. And then it's going to the server and ending up being misunderstood. But if it goes too far, it exceeds the allowed region of memory for the type of for the segment of code you're using. So typically, you get the ability to actually get 40 characters or maybe 400 characters, and that's about it. So you can't put a huge exploit in an initial attack. So what you do is you put in a small thing that can only be like 40 or 50 characters long that just connects to a server and downloads more a little FTP script or something. That's how real malware typically works. When you first get infected, the actual network traffic over the wire will send in something to a vulnerable service and then just put in a few lines of command line to connect somewhere and download more. And that's why, uh, until it came out last week, that Kaspersky antivirus was the medium used to steal the NSA exploits, like Eternal Blue that we've been using here. Um, the most popular theory, which everyone said, is that the uh, Russians compromised one of our staging servers. Because this is what you typically do. You take over a server somewhere, and you put malware on it, and then you serve it up with HTTP or, a, or FTP. And that's what's used by the next target. You connect to that one and download the stuff. And your staging server is just on somebody's box you hacked. So it's pretty common that they catch you, and they steal the stuff on there. And that's where they thought they stole all that stuff. But considering what they really have, if you get the original, eternal, uh, original um, dump from the Russians, it's there. It's Fuzzbunch, and Fuzzbunch is the NSA's met Metasploit. So it is much more than the stuff you'd have on the staging server. It is the stuff you'd have on the main command and control server that's initiating the attack. And that is clearly what happened. Now we know what happened. Someone at the NSA went home and started hacking machines from his home machine using the cop secret tools in an unsecure network that had Kaspersky antivirus on it. And Kaspersky detected the stuff as exploits and sent it home. And then it turned out that Kaspersky had, in fact, been hacked either with their consent or without by the KGB because the antivirus is the perfect theft tool. It scans every file in your box, sends a signature home, and if it fits certain criteria, it sends a copy home. So they can just steal anything they want to off your box, and they were, which is why the government won't let you use Kaspersky anymore on anything important, anything government or military. Anyway, 
So typically the first thing you'll see is a downloader and the downloader will download more and that's what these staged payloads are here. So this payload Windows Interpreter Reverse TCP, if you um, get info about it, it will tell you down here someplace that it's staged. TCP stager. All right. Um, the alternatives inline payloads, these are ones that are delivered all in one chunk. And inline payload will uh, require an exploit that lets you put in larger text. So if you really want to get into this, like I say, the exploit development class, you spend a lot of time worrying about how much room you have and how to make exploit small enough to fit in the available space. Metasploit, of course, contains only the result of all that. Exploit development is our class that basically takes you to what it takes to write one of these meta Metasploit exploits. Although, the, uh, so far, we haven't gone so far as to actually write them, but I'm thinking that might be good to do next time I teach that class, because there's quite a few things like Eternal Romance that should be a Metasploit, and they aren't. That would be a fine class project to write the Metasploit module for it. It's not that hard. Anyway, um, so Metterpreter is the custom payload for Metasploit. This is intended to be the all-purpose hacking tool that you want to use whenever possible. As you've seen, it's all full of great stuff like screenshot and hash dump and, and get system, gloriously powerful things that you want right there. Um, and I didn't know this, but it uses encryption to encrypt all the traffic. That's pretty cool. Um, I never bothered looking at it in Wireshark, but that's a good sign. And um, it's loaded by dill injection, which is the main way that you um, exploit Windows boxes. Uh, I mentioned before the dynamic, uh, dynamic linked libraries, which is what Windows uses, is an intrinsically insecure and unsanitary system where a library is loaded for one program and another program just uses the code that's already been put there by somebody else. And they don't have any way to know if that code's been modified or anything, so it is the natural easy way to trick a program into running attack code is to mess with the libraries, and that's how this works. So, um, if you do an Nmap scan of our Windows target, you will find a ZAMP and WebDAV. We did this before, and let me just uh, go live and let's do this stuff. I got them all running here. So here's my Windows 124 box, 172.16.207. Here's my attacker. So, Nmap. Uh, let's do this, 172.16.1.207, all right, nope, must be wrong, 172.16.1.207, what did I do wrong? No targets were specified, all right, you guys see what I did wrong? I don't see it. No targets were specified. All right, I've he really lost my mind. I can't run Nmap anymore. Either I've had a stroke or something. Uh, why can't I run Nmap? Nmap, yes. Uh, IP, IF config. Ping. Ah, there's the problem. Okay, something's wrong with my networking. That is very rude of Nmap to tell me my syntax is wrong when it's a thing like that. All right. So let's go see my Windows box is here. Let's see if I can, all right, this is typical troubleshooting we always do. Okay, this one's on the internet, that's a good sign. And it's really 207, okay. Let's see if this one's on the internet. Come on, knock it off. Stop giving me nonsense, okay. Ping Google. Okay, there's my problem. How about DH client? Minus V E zero. I get a fresh IP address. It did that. Right. What adapter. is? Do you see what the problem is? Adapter. What adapter? On your host machine. Well, I'm using the wireless, and it's working. Um, what is this nonsense? Um, e zero down. E zero up. Ah, all right. That's the kind of stuff that gives me a bad attitude. I mean, that's rude. There's nothing wrong. You just have to go down and up. That's a bug. Anyway, such is life. There are bugs in everything. So now I can probably ping that box. You know, I'd like to, I'd like to have, okay, now I can ping the Windows box. Now I can probably Nmap the box. I think it was very rude of Nmap to tell me I didn't specify the target when what it meant was your network is down. That's not the same thing. Anyway, there we go. All right. 
So A means use all intent scanning options, and it'll probably take a couple minutes. So I'll just let it go, but we'll be coming back looking at that more as we go ahead, of course, because this is your first step. First, you use NetDiscover to find all the machines in your subnet. Then you use Nmap to get an idea of what you've got. And then you use other tools after that, although uh, Stuart was just telling me about something. Sparta. Sparta. It does all this automatically. Yeah. Sparta is a pen testing tool that will automatically scan everything on your network. It's just a head of relative. So, all the ports. And, right, it does Nikto and then map. By and, yeah, SQ default, SMTP default. All yeah, that. that's great. So it's a good uh, surveillance tool. Um, a good scanning tool to find all the goodies. So anyway, if you do the NMAP scan, it's going to find a whole bunch of stuff in that box, of course, because it's loaded with about a dozen vulnerable things. But one thing it's going to find is an HTTP header that has DAV in it. And this means it is supporting uh, the technology called DAV, Distributed Authoring and Versioning, and this automatically uploads stuff from a folder on your machine to the server. I used to have a very old blog platform that did this. Any file you put in a certain folder would just automatically appear on the server. It's automatically doing FTP in the background, and that's what this is for. It's very popular. So here they're running XAMPP. Now, you know LAMP servers are Linux servers. Linux, Apache, MySQL, and PHP. That's what it stands for. Most people either run Linux shops and they run LAMP servers to do their web job, or they run Microsoft shops and they run IIS. Those are the two choices. If they run IIS, they use Exchange and Microsoft SQL. If they're running Linux, they use Apache, MySQL, and PHP to do the same job. So the point is, if you wanted to run a LAMP server on Windows, then they call it XAMPP, or WAMP is another term you might use, Windows, Apache, MySQL, and PHP. I don't know how many people do this. To me, it's kind of nuts to run open source stuff on Windows. But you can run Apache on Windows, PHP on Windows, it's just, why would you? But I think there are a lot of people that want to use these open source web things, but they don't like running Linux. So anyway, it exists, and XAMPP is one of the packages that will run those open source web products on Windows. And if you do it, especially in the early versions, it tends to be dangerously insecure. That's what we're going to exploit here. So they got this web dev thing running, which will automatically let people upload files. And of course, it's misconfigured. And here's XAMPP running. And in this case, the problem with XAMPP is it uh, has web dev included in it, and it has default credentials. And if they didn't change the default credentials, we can get right in. So you can connect with Cadaver. Cadaver is the command line tool to connect to web devs. So you just give it the IP address and the web dev, and then it needs a name and password. And if you just use, I think, WAMP WAMP, that's the default password. And if that's in, not been changed, you can now upload files to the server. And this is why people hack websites and put up embarrassing masks and stuff. It's pretty easy with this sort of thing. So I can now set up a file like test.htm, and it'll appear on the server. So that's just a website defacement. And this is a very weak kind of defacement. So I don't know if it, the script kiddies don't seem to be up to this the way they were in 2011, 2012. Back then, everybody was hacking everybody as a political statement. And it was advertising their skills. And if you are really, really, really lame, all you can do is add another file to the server that doesn't already exist. So nobody's ever going to see it, because it's not the home page or linked to the home page. But you can say, irs.gov slash fred.htm and your name is up there. I hacked IRS and in some sense you did, but in another sense it's really lame because you didn't steal the data, you didn't get a real password, you didn't really change anything that anyone will ever see. And that's what this kind of defacement is. Which is, by the way, if you're, uh, this was always considered the gentlest way to tell somebody they have a vulnerability. You don't hurt anybody and you prove they have a vulnerability. However, it's still illegal. But you've done almost no damage. In fact, it might not be prosecutable because they can't prosecute unless they can show, I think, $5,000 worth of damage. And a thing like that, I'm not sure it really does them any harm at all. Anyway, that violates integrity. But what you'd really like is remote code execution. So to do that, you try to upload a PHP file. You make a file called anything, typically used info.php. This is the typical stuff you put in it because it's just easy to remember and it tells you if PHP is running on the server. And the way PHP works is one of the many disturbing weaknesses about Apache, the way you run PHP, see the whole problem with the web is C made sense. You'd make a source code called C, you run it through a compiler like GCC, then you get object code you can run. That was the way programming started. C and Fortran and BASIC worked like that. Then they invented the web and they had this horrible thing called HTML which runs even if the syntax is wrong. And then they wanted to have junk like JavaScript, so now you've got two languages in the same file. 
And these days, you typically have 30 languages all mixed in the same file on the same server. So this is a recipe for madness. It leads to huge security problems as you put in code that is misunderstood by the various parsers that try to guess what part of this junk is PHP, what part of this junk is HTML, what part of it is something I don't recognize at all because it's a later version than I am. So how am I going to figure out what part to ignore? And all you have to do is make a mistake in any of all those parsers and you have holes. So the way it actually works on the server is it looks at the file name. And if it has PHP in the file name, it interprets it as PHP code instead of just a static file to serve up. And in some versions of Apache and some configuration settings, it will even take PHP in the wrong part of the name. So you could have a file that's supposed to only take images, like pings, and you could upload a file called phpfred.ping, and it'll let you upload it as an image, but then you can execute it as PHP. Because the uh, Apache settings just specify a sort of regular expression, and anything that satisfies that, we interpret as PHP and execute with the PHP runner. Yeah. Can you put a uh, payload in that? Yes, you can. Like what? Interpreter has a whole ton, Metasploit has a ton of exploits in PHP versions. Like MSFNM? Yes. Yes. So wouldn't that be MSFNM. RC? Yeah, it is. Okay. That's the point. This right. is so right okay. now we were able to upload a plain text file and see it. Now we want to upload some kind of active code and run it. So you make a PHP file and upload it. And if you go there and, you, and it's not doesn't have PHP, you'll just see that. But if it does have PHP, you'll see this, which is the result of running that command. And now you have remote code execution. You can now execute PHP commands on the server by uploading a file with those commands and then browsing to it. And when Apache tries to serve it up, it will recognize that this has a PHP at the end of the name and it will therefore run it through the PHP engine and show you the result instead of just showing the contents of the file, which is what it would have done for HTM. So MSF Venom has a whole bunch of PHP. All you got to do is run the payloads and grep for PHP. You've got PHP everything, interpreter bind, interpreter reverse, bind IPv6, all in PHP. So you can make them here. Another thing I saw a lot of people doing at the pen testing contest is going online and downloading from like GitHub and blogs, somebody's favorite PHP malware. People used to write these things that were all over the place. So all the script kiddies who didn't even know what they were doing would just get Fred's PHP shell, upload it to servers, and now you have it in there. Sort of like putting up back orifice or something. It was easy enough to do that you didn't even need to know much of what you were doing. You just know a default name and password for a content management system, upload a file, and now you can deface the server, put your name on it, and brag. So um, anyway, that's the game here. This makes PHP malware. So you just use MSF Venom, and as you know, if you're going to have a reverse shell, you've got to specify the command and control IP address and the command and control port number. Now you put it out in raw, because it doesn't need to be compiled or anything, into a file ending in PHP. So my interpreter.php is your file, and if you open it, if you look at the top, you'll just see PHP code. Less than PHP, if set, this is just line after line of PHP code that adds up to my interpreter. So it's big and long but it's automatically generated, so we don't care. So now you just upload it with Cadaver, browse to it in the web, and it will make a shell coming back. So you uh, browse to it here, it will run, and that will open your session. So this is one way to get remote code execution. Now, um, the next thing is PHP My Admin. PHP My Admin is a popular tool, at least it used to be. I don't know how many people are still using it. The point of this, um, there are a lot of web developers that really do not know much about networking and much about security and much about servers either. They just have a graphical interface where they can click a button, post something, put up a link and all that jazz, and they live in there. The way a lot of like office workers just live inside Microsoft Word and Excel, and they really don't have any clue what's going on except inside there. So um, phpMyAdmin is a common solution for this. And it looks like this. There's some admin page, and you're supposed to have to log in to get here. And once you do, you now just have buttons you can click to execute SQL command, upload files, change prints, and you just run it here. If you go to web hosting platforms like um, GoDaddy, it's similar. They have an online graphical page you can use to upload and download files and make settings. So this one here will uh, let you execute SQL commands on the server. So this should be protected um, with some kind of barrier, like a login page. But another thing people often do is forget to put a password on it, or they have a default password on it. And then you can get in here. It's very easy. And once you're in there, you can now run SQL. And as you've done in the last class with SQL injection, if you have SQL injection, you can write code to a file by select 
literal code into outfile. You can now write into a file. So what you do is you write PHP code into the file. And this is the, this is the simplest PHP shell, just system uh, of underscore get command. This will take a parameter named CMD and execute it at a shell as a line of, of shell code. So that's the simplest thing. Once you have done that, now you go to your shell, you put question mark CMD equals ipconfig, and it runs ipconfig, and you see the answer. So that's, uh, that's a PHP shell. These things are awesome. They're easy to use. Anytime you can add files to a server, and the server supports PHP, you can run a PHP shell, except at GoDaddy. Now, I had a person come to me whose website had been hacked. All right, I really appreciated more people bring me hacked websites to fix because I learned a lot doing it. I couldn't get, I found like a dozen colleges four years ago that were all infected with similar malware and not one of them would let me fix it. So I had to try to guess what it was from the outside and I could only get so far. But I finally got to go into a hacked account because somebody at a college got hacked and their website was redirected to a porn page. And instead of just freaking out, they left it that way and let me get on there. But the problem is they had a cheap GoDaddy account. And a cheap GoDaddy account doesn't even give you command line access. All you have is FTP access. So I got an FTP name and password, and I could see the files, and I hunted around through the files till I found the file that was doing it. But what was interesting was it hosted about a dozen local copies of pages to fanned out, but they weren't in the directories I could see with the FTP client. I was stuck in their home directory, and I couldn't scan the whole thing. So I needed a shell on their server. And the only way to get a shell on GoDaddy is to pay them more money. But I said, I don't need to pay them any stinking money. I can get a shell the same way the bad guys do. So I tried to upload this. I made a PHP file, and it was awesome. I'd upload my PHP shell, it would appear, and then poof, it's gone. I said, hey. That's impossible. It happened again. They're running some kind of antivirus on their server that looks for PHP shells and removes it. So all I had to do was modify this by just a couple characters. I put in, like, I changed this to X, and I put in, like, two carriage returns or something, and now it passed. So they have the lamest antivirus on Earth that just looks for the top 10 PHP shells and deletes them, trying to stop the dumbest script kitties. And so then I had a shell on the server, and then I could traverse out of the home folder over to other folders where the malware really was. So anyway, I was able to escalate my privileges beyond what we paid for on GoDaddy in order to clean it. And that was, that was good clean fun. So, Is that legal? Well, I wondered about whether that was legal. It's <laughs> <laughs> a good question. If GoDaddy wanted to, they could try and claim that I should have paid them for that privilege. But again, I think the amount of damage is, um, is negligible. This is like if I park outside your house and I use your unsecured Wi-Fi. Now, if you wanted to be a jerk, you could say, I should pay 1% of your monthly ISP bill now because you used 1% of the bandwidth, but nobody's ever won. So I mean, technically, it's probably a minor offense, but in practice, I don't think anyone can be punished. Um, if I was to do something rotten, like hack websites and put up stuff, then I'd get in trouble. But I think the only thing I did here was exceed my authorized access, and I thought of it. The only thing that would, the thing that would, the only, the only punishment that could possibly happen is they could cancel that person's account at GoDaddy saying, you're exceeding your access. But in reality, nobody's ever going to know or care. It's only going to care if you actually do something significant. But you're right. It is a little bit over the edge. And this is like I say, I used to be very careful never not to break the law. And everyone laughed at me. And then I finally realized that I was still breaking the law right and left, whether I doubt how careful you get. Um, and I finally realized I'm no different than the rest of them. You have to go a little bit into the gray to get anything done. <laughs> and so now you're down to not just strictly obeying the letter of the law, but moving over to where you really won't get prosecuted. And the thing that got me was um, Rapid7. Um, Rapid7 scans the entire internet with a vulnerability scanner every hour, and they publish the results. And that violates the CFAA about four billion times a day. And they do this in partnership with the Department of Homeland Security. So even the government is well aware of the fact that the cybercrime laws are impossible to not break. If you want to get anything done, you have to break those laws. And they said so a year and a half ago at DEF CON. They had the Department of Justice there and lawyers, and they said, we understand that everything you guys do is illegal, but you can trust us to only prosecute the bad guys with our prosecutorial discretion. <laughs> We will decide if you're a good guy and then not prosecute. And I said, well, you know, this is kind of back. We're supposed to be a nation of laws, but in fact, it's not that different than medieval times. It was just the king's justice. If the king likes you, everything you do is fine. If the king hates you, off with your head. No particular other rules, but that is kind of where we're at. So, 
Such is life. So I try to have a good reputation and be on good terms with law enforcement, and so far they haven't locked me up. But, um, you know, this is why you end up with cases like that guy Marcus Hutchins that saved us all, probably saved quite a few human lives by freezing WannaCry, but two years before that, he was doing all this script kitty stuff on the forums and they arrested him. And you might say maybe they ought to forgive him, but they don't seem to be forgiving him yet. So, you know, it's tough. Yeah, it's a good question. I worried about it. <laughs> um, but I decided, you know, uh, you, you have to break a few eggs to cook an omelet. You have to take some risk to get anything done. Anyway, um, so, but don't you guys go doing horrible things like robbing a bank and then saying I told you to. Uh, <laughs> but the fact is, people do commit quite a few minor crimes. And as we all know, to some extent, you can get away with it. It's just, I tried to pretend I was above all that, but I guess I'm not. Anyway, so, uh, anyway. Um, all right, here's an annoying thing. If you take over a Windows machine and you get the ability to execute a command line, you might want to do something more than execute a command line. And if you want to upload more, there's no wget. But as we saw in a couple of classes ago, I found this thing called bits add bin. But your author of this book did not know that. Georgia didn't know it, and I didn't know it until about a month ago. There is a command line tool on Windows that will download a file. So the other solution is to use FTP or TFTP. So if you want, if you're trying to make your own stager, you find something like a command injection where you can put up one line of code, then you can use a TFTP server. So this is in Kali. You run this thing, and it will listen on this address and serve up files with TFTP. TFTP is the Trivial File Transfer Protocol. It runs on port 69 with no name and no password required. All you have to do is request files by file name, and they go over the network. And it's commonly used to, update, to upload firmware into routers and switches and IP phones. It's intended to be used only on closed networks because it's fantastically insecure. There's no name and password or authentication at all. So you can totally upload malicious files and go to the wrong address and everything else. It's only supposed to be used like from your laptop to the router to update the firmware. But you can run it on Metasploit and then you can uh, make a, there's a TFTP command line command in Windows. So you can run TFTP IP address get file name and it will upload it by TFTP. And if you just have a TFTP server running, it'll hand it over. And in the world of Cisco network administration, you'll learn if you take the Cisco classes, you typically run the SolarWinds TFTP server on Windows to host the software and feed it up to a router. And in the world of Kali, you just run it with this command on Kali and it'll serve it up. So that is a simple way to have a simple command line way to move a file up to a server. Um, and then you make a staged attack. You send something small like a single line of CMD that when you run that, that will download some more. This is typically how malware really works. All right, now I got a few cahoots about that stuff. All right, so I'll wait another 10 seconds. Four, five. All right, six questions. So what payload should you use if the target has a firewall? Okay, a reverse shell, that's what it's for. It phones home to the command and control server and outgoing traffic is typically permitted, but by firewalls much more easily than incoming traffic. All right, what payload is best if you can only put up a small amount of code? That's the point, stage code. So you upload a small uploader, which then uploads more. All right, what kind of payload encrypts the traffic? Okay, that's my interpreter. Pretty awesome. All right, which one of these is a Linux server? That's LAMP. That's what the L is. LAMP is a Linux server. All right, which one is a command line client? Oh, 
Okay, that's a cadaver. All right. And which one of these creates exploit files? Alright, MSF Venom, good, a popular answer. Alright, well let's uh, take a 10 minute break, pick up at 5 minutes to 7. Okay, so you can also use FTP, that's what I used years ago, which is even more the way malware does it. There's an FTP server inside Metasploit. You can just use auxiliary server FTP, it will then serve up things from the directory. You can set the root to point someplace and put your malware in that directory. And then you can write a text file, which will do it in FTP. This is a script. It's the username and password for FTP. This changes the local cur uh, current directory to the place where you want to put the malware. And this gets it and puts it up there. This is what a lot of real malware does. I've seen it. That's where I got the idea. I've seen this in real malware. And uh, so you make the script file with um, SQL injection. So you up upload each line as a separate text variable and then you tell it to use fields terminated by carriage return. So it was one line of SQL but it turns into four lines of text at the other end. And then you run it with FTP minus S colon script. And then the IP address because you have a PHP shell that will let you run a line of command. So you, you, this will connect to that server and then run commands from that script. And that script has those four lines, so that will connect to my server and upload the other file I want to upload. So, Could you please yeah. go to the query? What's to that? To the slide before this one. To the query. Yeah, the query's here. So remember, you can select quote text into out file, and that will put it in there. Here you select four separate things into out file, and then you have fields terminated by uh, carriage return. Oh. So it makes four lines of out file. That's one way to do it. All right, and so then you can now run that, and that will, of course, um, open another Meterpreter session because now you have found a way to get Meterpreter uploaded to the server. Just another trick. So anyway, once you've, um, so let's play with this one. You may remember every time you restart your uh, VM, your Windows 124 VM, it has this box that pops up asking you about Zervit. That's because I could not find any way to make this thing launch automatically. So every time it asks you, so this is the lab where we're finally going to use it. So the answer is 3232 and yes, this will start yet another old, horrible, vulnerable product. So this is now a web server serving on port 3232, allowing you to view directories. So now you can attack this thing from anywhere that can see it. For example, my host, 172.16.1.207. I can just put that here, 172.16.1.207. On 32.32, now I see a directory. Now the way I installed it, it's in C program files. So this is C program files. That's why it has folders like HXD and immunity for the immunity uh, debugger and so on. So you can now traverse this file system seeing what's here. Now I might be able to go up. It looks like that doesn't work. But I can go down and I can open a text file. So now I've got the change log for this HXD product, which is not interesting. But what is interesting is now I have a path here, and I can execute directory traversal. And I got this from your book, although I don't know why. The normal way you do directory traversal is this way. You trim this away and do dot, dot, slash, dot, dot, slash, dot, dot, slash. And if you do that, you never get any higher than the original home directory here. But for some reason, you can do it with a question mark after this question mark, dot dot slash dot dot slash. So it's not actually the path in the URL that is vulnerable, it's something like the query that's vulnerable. But if I do that, I now get a directory of a different directory, and if you know your Windows, this is, you can all know this is the root of C, where you have boot and autoexec.bat and documents and settings and config.sys. I've now broken out of the home directory right up to the root of C, so I can now view or download any file from this box. And this is what tends to happen with BitTorrent and any other file sharing 
product, the, one of the most common mistakes is you share your whole drive by accident or some large portion of it. Uh, so now that I can traverse the box, the question is what shall I download that would be fun to have? And uh, one thing that's fun to have is the FileZilla XML file. That is, FileZilla is part of XAMPP. It's another, uh, I don't know if it's BitTorrent or what it is, it's some kind of file sharing client. But the, the th fun thing about it is it uses usernames and passwords and it hashes them with MD5, which is really weak. So you can get them by going to XAMPP FileZilla FTP FileZilla server up here. So you put that junk here and I'm just going to steal it from my project instructions so I don't have to bother trying to type it. This, all I'm showing you here is project 11. You're going to do this stuff. So the stuff to put here is that junk. XAMPP FileZilla FTP FileZilla server.xml. If you put that here, you download, this fooled me at first. You put that junk here, it vanishes, and you download a file, and the file is named changelog.txt. That's the name, but it's lying. That file actually contains the FileZilla file. If you open that file in a text editor, that's what you see. This is not the changelog. This is the FileZilla configuration file, and it has configuration files, and down here it has user configurations, and there it has MD5-based hash words. And um, if you remember from 123 how to crack password hashes, there's Hashcat and all sorts of stuff, but if you don't feel like wasting time on that, you just use Google for lame things like MD5 passwords. And there it is, WAMP. That will work on simple passwords. Somebody else has already broken it and put it on the web. But, you know, if that doesn't work, you can use John the Ripper or Hashcat or something. All right. And MD5 hashes are pretty easy to crack. You can try like 10 million guesses per second or 100 million guesses per second. All right, now in the book, they're atta uh, attacking Windows XP. And Windows XP, you can actually get the SAM and the system file. Now, if you aren't familiar with Windows security, let's take a look at this, see Windows System 30. If you actually go onto the Windows machine, so you can see all the boxes, all the files, you can go here to computer, come on, computer I say, and then C, Windows, System32, and Config, I think. Yep, Config is here. All right. So in here, there are some files. These are super important files, like SAM and Security. And SAM is 256 kilobytes, and Security is 256 kilobytes. These are registry hives. And these are where Microsoft stores login passwords. It stores them in the SAM file, and they are encrypted with reversible encryption, and the key is in the system file. So uh, I don't know why they wasted their time on that. So uh, if you have a Windows file system, all you have to do is get SAM and system, and you can use system to decrypt SAM and get the password hashes. And then you can crack the hashes because they're even more weaker than MD5 hashes. Microsoft uses MD4 hashes, which, as you can imagine, are even older and weaker than MD5. Um, so, that sounds great, but in order to protect this, Microsoft has made this folder hard to get at. And so even though I can traverse the file system, I can't get in there. See Windows System 32 config, and let's try it. If I go back to here, where I can apparently get anything I want, let's try uh, Windows. All right, no, I can't do it that way, but I can do it this way. Windows System 32. Yeah, I got to put in the config SAM. And I can't get it. There are permissions that won't let me get it from here. And this was true even on Windows XP. But in Windows XP, there was an automatic backup of these files created in C Windows Repair, and that was not protected. So you could just go in there and get backup files. But they took that out of server 2008. So that part of the exploitation we cannot do in this manner. Um, as far I could not find any way to just download a file that will get me the Windows login password hashes here. If you want those hashes, you have to do something like get a interpreter shell and use get system and, and get the hashes. Hash dump. All right, you can traverse to them, but you can't get to them. And that's because this is over, and XP is pretty much over, except for embedded devices. So that direct attack isn't going to work, although a related attack is to just restart this computer boot from a Linux disk and then just copy it off of there. That's the same thing as taking a forensic image of it. And that'll work as long as they don't have BitLocker drive encryption turned on. If they do, then that won't work either. All right. 
So uh, then you can try other things here like SL Mail. This is one she uh, has in the book. Uh, you can run SL Mail. It's installed on these things, but it quit listening on port 110 and it won't start again. So as far as I can tell, this doesn't work reliably enough to be worth doing on uh, Windows Server 2008. And it's not really interesting because it's just a normal Metasploit attack. And all you have to do is set a couple parameters and exploit it. So I don't think that's worth bothering to struggle with. There's third-party web applications, which is the same. In the book, they had a Linux target running something called TickyWiki, which has a Metasploit attack against it. And you've tried enough Metasploit attacks in this class and a previous class. Again, it's not very important. The only thing about this one was you had PHP payloads, but I didn't think it was worth adding another whole virtual machine to the class just to do that. It's not important enough. What is important is some of this other stuff. Now, this one's kind of fun, and it's in Metasploitable. I don't know how common this is, but um, there are known poisoned programs out there. So this is the, if you run Nmap on your Metasploitable target, it will tell you it's VSFTPD 2.3.4, which is a known poisoned version of that product. Someone hacked the development environment, and people downloaded the poisoned product. This just happened to CCleaner. There's a poisoned version of CCleaner out there with two or three million people using it. So there may be some version of this that would hack you through the CCleaner. And the VSFTP download was hacked so that if you log in with a smiley face, you get root access. So that's all you have to do. So I've got my Metasploitable running over here. All right, and there's my IP address, 172.16.1190. So let's scan it, 72.16.1.190. If I do nmap, now that it's working, um, on ports 20 and 21 only, just to make it faster, and um, 172.16.1.190. That should only take a few seconds, and it does. And it finds what? Ah, anonymous login a lot, VSFTPD234. That's all I'm looking for. It got the banner. I could just as well have gotten that by doing netcat. So now I'll connect. It's an FTP service. So I tried FTP. FTP is not installed on Linux by default. Neither is LFTP. It's kind of nuts. So you have to do apt get install FTP. I don't know why, but you do. So um, I'm going to do it all in one line, FTP. Um, the address, 172.16.1.190. Okay, my name is Sam with a smiley face. The password is anything, and it just hangs there. This is what's supposed to happen. It's hanging because it's opened a listening port. Now you netcat to the same thing on port 6200, I think. And now it looks like you have nothing, but you don't. If you do who am I, your root, if you do you name, minus A, you're metasploitable. You're not seeing any prompts, but you now have root access for the thing. And this is like some other attacks we've done. Listening shells tend to be like this. You don't see the prompts because they haven't bothered to open both pipes. But you can do anything to the box now. So that's pretty awesome. A very simple Trojan. I can leave there, and then the other one will finish and leave. So that's an easy way to exploit the box if, you, if somebody is using services with that simple of a known vulnerability, a Trojan already built in. All right, but this one is more involved and more important, is exploiting NFS shares. Um, it is quite common that people use automatic sharing. There's a bunch of them in Windows, they're in Linux too. This is network file services or file sharing. It is a way to turn on a server and it's one of these um, RPC services. These things are notoriously vulnerable in Windows and Linux. The remote procedure calls run many services from the same port, and you have one port that's a directory that lists them all, and then you can request service from all these different things. So if you run an Nmap scan, it'll show you a lot of results, but the port 111 results will list all the RPCs, and one of them is NFS. So it is using NFS. Like Windows file shares and all other file shares, many people run shares without putting permissions on them to limit who can get in. So you can enumerate it with an nmap script. So let's take a look at this. Um, I'm going to do it from Kali. Uh, if I do, come on, stop messing with me. There we are. So I exit from here. OK, so let's do nmap, for starters, on that thing. And I'm just going to do port 111 to make it faster. All right, RPC bind is running on port 111. If I want to see everything, I do minus A. And that will give me more information about port 111 and be a little bit slower. All right, 
Now it gives me this whole list showing a variety of services on that port 111, including NFS. Now I can run scripts, and the one script that's most fun is NFS LS. So you can learn about it with um, script help. And then the name of it is NFS-LS. The name itself tells you pretty much what you need to know. And the first paragraph is all that really matters. This will connect to the network share and do an LS. So you see what they've got. So you run it with uh, script equals NFS. So NMAP, so dash dash script equals, and then the address. And it runs, it tells you a bunch of information I don't care about. And someplace up here, it fouled up on me. This happened to me before, and I just tried it a couple times and it started working. And I thought maybe it was just me. Um, yeah, okay, that's kind of nuts. The first time I didn't get the directory, and the second time I did. I think I'll put that in the project, just run it twice. <coughs> I just thought I must have done something wrong, but it wasn't my imagination. It fails the first time, and the second time it works. This is what you get for using hacking tools. Anyway, now you get a directory with permissions. And if you look at what's here, remember when we were in the other thing, we were at the root of C, and we knew we were at the root of C for what was there. Now I'm at the root of the whole system, mount, sbin, user, home. I'm not getting the whole directory, which is probably part of why I got nothing the first time. It doesn't seem to really work entirely. But I appear to be able to see the entire file system right from slash here. So that apparently, they shared the entire hard drive with NFS. So now I just have to use NFS. And the way you do that, if you're using Kali and you try to mount an NFS share, it will just fail with a confusing error message. And when you Google the error message, it will tell you, you need to, up, you need to add more software to correctly use NFS shares. You need to install NFS common. So after you do that, then you can mount it. You make a directory, you do mount minus T NFS. That will make a in your local file system, it will mount a remote file system so you can browse to it. Then you give it the IP address and path name to it, which is the root. It'll put it in temp mount. And I want to be able to both read and write for reasons you'll see later. So I do minus O no lock. And now I have read write permissions of that. Thing. So let's do that. And we'll see it live. So if I go here, I can make dir slash temp. Let's call it M. And then mount minus T and FS, and that number, 172. And then uh, it was slash temp, slash M, and minus O, no lock. All right, if I got it right, that will do it. And I can tell if I did it by going there. If I CD to slash temp, slash M, and now I do LS, minus L, now I see a whole Linux file system with mount and opt and proc and root and sbin and all these goodies. So one thing I see up here is home. So now that, this is very much like the uh, exploit we did on Windows where you can traverse the file system. So now I can see the file system of my target. What would be worth stealing here? Well, one thing that's fun is to go into home and see what's here. In home, I have various users. One of them is MSF admin, which is the one we've been using. So if I go in there, um, and look around. There's nothing much in there, something here called vulnerable. But if you do AL and look at the hidden files, there's a folder called SSH. And I know a lot of people were doing this in the pen testing contest. I saw a lot of them going by. So if you do get the ability to read files on our Linux server, you look for a .SSH. And when you get in there, you'll see three files. And those three files are authorized keys, the private key, and the public key. Now, my first thought is you'll steal the private key, but that really won't do you much good. That is not the way you hack this. So I was pleased to learn this today. The way you hack it is by writing into the authorized keys. So take a look at the authorized keys. The authorized keys contain uh, this one, SSH, so you, user at Metasploitable can get in. The second one is me hacking it earlier today. So I'm going to do it again. Um, this is how you do it. 
you want to SSH in. Now, as you know, you can use SSH with a password, but that's considered insecure. What's more cool is to use a certificate. And if you do, you don't put in a password at all. You put in a username, and it gets the certificate and sends it up to the server, and it recognizes it by its public key. You have the private key, which your computer uses to create a network request, which they can read with the public key and verify that it's correct. So what I have to do is make a key pair and send my public key up to that server and then it will recognize me as an authorized user. So, I just run SSH keygen. There are different ways to do it, but I can just run the default and it will be fine. So, um, it's here. There, that's all you have to do. SSH keygen. It will automatically do stuff. Just take the defaults for everything. I'm gonna overwrite. No passphrase, because I don't care. I'm a bad guy, I can be insecure. So now I've made my key, which is actually a shorter key and everything, but I figure it doesn't matter. Now I just have to take my private key. My public key is here, root SSH ID RSA.pub. So let's take a look at that, ls um, slash root dot SSH. So in there I have a thing called ID RSA pub. So if I cat that, That's my key, so all I have to do is take that and put it in authorized keys at the end. Now, if I cat authorized keys again, there are now three people allowed to SSH in and be accepted as this user, MSF admin. The original one, me hacking it earlier today, and me hacking it now. So now all I have to do is SSH into the box, SSH MSF admin at the IP address, and it'll let me in. Didn't like it. Signed and failed agent, refused operation. How rude. I don't know what I did wrong. Worked earlier today. Maybe I need to clean the junk out of that file. Let's, um, I can probably just nano that file. Let's try that. Get rid of the middle one. I don't know what this will do, but there's one way to find out. Agent refused operation. How rude. Let me check my slides and see if I have anything wrong here. Cat authorized keys. Yeah, it should have just took it. Oh, I know why. Ah. Um, I think I do. List of known hosts. No, it shouldn't be the known hosts. Um, well, that's kind of annoying. Uh, anyway, I'm not going to struggle with that one and figure out why the second attack against the same box failed right now. But um, let me just show you the problem. The problem is if you do this, you are not root. You are MSF admin. And if you try to do sudo, it asks you for MSF admin's password which you don't know so far. In fact, it is MSF admin, but the point is, this didn't get me a root shell. But of course, the only reason it didn't get me a root shell is because I didn't hack the right authorized key file. All I have to do is move over and put it in roots, authorized keys. So that's the attack there, and I've already done it here. I think if I don't try doing it again, I can demonstrate that one live because I won't mess it up. So notice how I'm in temp m home MSF admin SSH. All I have to do is go up a few to temp m, and in here there is root. So I go in there and do ls minus al, and in there there is another dot ssh. So I go in there, and in there there is authorized keys. And like I say earlier today, I put my key in there. Now I just regenerated a new key, so it's probably not going to accept me, but let's find out at um, 172.16.1.190. Right, it's asking me for a password because it didn't accept the key. So I'm going to make one more try to fix this. Um, let's cat my local thing, root dot ssh dot id rsa dot pub. Uh, okay, I somehow, oh, okay, I put the tilde there. I should just get rid of that. There, there's my key. All right. So I can put that in the clipboard. 
Okay, now I can nano authorized keys and I can put it in here and get rid of that stuff and supposedly that will make me authorized but it didn't work last time. I'm assuming I made some kind of mistake. Yep, I made some kind of mistake. I don't know what's wrong. Yeah. So are you actually on the box 172.16.1.190? Yeah. Wait, or am I just looking at a... No, I am. Yeah, I'm out of the file system. It's read-write. So I'm changing the contents of that box. And it worked earlier today, but now I'm doing it again and it's not working. Hopefully this won't happen to all of you doing the project. I don't know what's happened why it's quit working now. Um, agent refused operation. Sign and send... In fact, since... Uh, let me just make a little more attempt to fix this. Since I have an error message, I wonder if somebody will tell me what this error message means. All right. Run SSH add. That's what I did essentially. Then you get this. SSH add. On the client machine, that will add the key to the agent. Oh, well, I didn't know that. So I, that's interesting. All right, let's try that. <coughs> Oh, look at that. It's something local. When you change your key, you have to tell it you changed your key. Ha! Huh. Well, that's awesome. So my local machine didn't like me changing my key without running SSH add afterwards. Well, that's good. I'm glad I Googled it. Now I feel better. So now I have root on the box. And that's what I wanted to show you. Um, that was interesting. All right. So um, let me go back to my slides and see if there's anything else fun to show you. Uh, nope, that's it. So I, all I got is some more cahoots. Anyway. Uh, so, what's on port 111? Hmm. That's kind of a stupid question, but I guess such is life. This is like CISSP. There's one answer that's somewhat less stupid. All right, you can get to NFS there. It's not really running on that port, but there's like a, a directory entry on that port pointing to it. So that's a pretty stupid question. Whoever wrote these should get a pay cut. Anyway, um, all right. Which service do you exploit with a smiley face? All right, that's VS FTPD. That was, by the way, I thought this was kind of silly when the book had it there, and I remembered the first time I taught this course, we all used Solaris, and Solaris had a similar vulnerability for six months before anybody noticed that went like this. All you had to do was an R login, which logs in over the network, into any Solaris server as root, and it will not check the password at all, and you're in as root. And it was that way for six months before anybody noticed and fixed it. So this incredibly stupid stuff just keeps happening. <laughs> Like there was some Australian, some important Australian box just got hacked last week because the username was admin and the password was admin. Mm -hmm. I mean, this stuff just keeps happening. You, you think you have to be a genius, but you don't. There's a lot of stuff just blowing in the breeze out there. And that applies to like the pen testing championship. I saw people downloading the Rocky list and trying to break 100 million passwords. And the organizers were agreeing with me, you know, they should go for the low hanging fruit. There's like just a file on your desktop with a password in it. You gotta look for that stuff first. <laughs> Yeah. Well, what I was told is, is that we should be using the 250,000 password list. 250,000? No, just 250,000. That's what I thought. Instead of the millions. That's what I would have thought. Yeah. yeah. Whenever all my projects, I don't make you hunt through 100 million passwords. I mean, you put it in like the top 100 because it's boring to wait for hours while it spins. But you know, that's right. But anyway, that's um. There's a lot of them just sitting there. So which service has its password as MD5, which is what I would call low-hanging fruit. All right, uh, that was FileZilla did that. All right, and where is a private key?
All right, that's the IDRSA, that's private. All right, which one of those files contains a password? All right, that's good. None of them, of course, that is the whole point of public key authentication. You don't use passwords, use these cryptographic keys instead. All right, so there's the folks. Hey, it looks like pretty much the same winners. So Cam is six, tip, 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 who I've identified is six. Kaji is the new one. So Kaji, is Kaji here? Perhaps Kaji is remote. Then I'll wait a few, a little while to see if Kaji can send me a text message over this Zoom to tell me who you are. And I'm just going to clean up and go up to the lab. 